Looks like I'm on a holiday that's going to end Though it's not fair to anyone But I'm young, I had had fun in a long time No, it's not fair to anyone I'm swimming with fish, I'm thinking of all the bright colors I miss I'm swimming with fish Heads underwater, I call it a miss. I'm swimming with fish. I'm wondering how I can take all of this. But I'm swimming and stalling. The radio's calling on me. That was a song called Swimming With Fish. It's one of the two singles you can find out right now by today's guests, Elbow Down. So Elbow Down is fronted by a man named, I think it's Graham Ragan. I'm having a bit of trouble saying it right now because he doesn't pronounce it Reagan. But the point is, I met Graham Ragan in Montreal uh, a couple years ago playing at open mics. I think we actually were playing at this jazz club in Montreal, interestingly enough. Uh, I don't think he's a jazz musician, I'm certainly not, but it was just sort of the place we'd stumbled into. Uh, Graham is a former teacher, Graham is someone who also does a lot of painting, so I was very curious to see what his band was up to. And indeed, in the two singles they've put out, they've put out a very mysterious sound, a, a very cool sound with just their three-piece band, and uh, some very mysterious, depressing yet intriguing at the same time lyrics, uh, particularly with Swimming with Fish. They have a great piece of cover art of some fish swimming over a mystical piece of water. So I'm very curious to see what we learn about Graham today and about the rest of his band, Gavin and Shaddy. So uh, let's check out this interview. Right. So I'm joined by uh, the band Elbow Down, uh, Elbow Down today. That's singer guitarist Graham Reagan, singer bassist Gavin Reagan, and uh, drummer uh, Shaddy Amhaz, uh, or Shady as it's as you're referred to on <laughs> Spotify and I guess as your, as your stage <laughs> name. So let's start with the obvious question. Why, why the band named Elbow Down? Um, so Elbow Down, basically like when I was born, I have something like an injury called Herb's Palsy, which like you'll see like maybe in the video, like my elbow is kind of like at an odd like angle. And it's basically like nerve damage that's in my spine. And uh, so basically, I remember my mom, when I was a kid, used to tell me um, when I do activities, like hold a glass, like I should try and keep my elbow down because it kind of activates the nerve that I want. You want to kind of correct it, like self-correct it. And yeah. so I was trying to come up with uh, a band name, like shortly after I was at Montreal and I was carrying a glass into my room. And then I had that voice in my head that reminded me like, oh, Graham, elbow down. And I was like, oh, that would be a cool band name. And I was like, oh, so I, I just tried it out. And then it just, it sort of stuck. I was like, oh, it sort of seems like a kind of interesting. And it was like, you know, it, I tested it on a bunch of people and they're like, oh yeah, it makes me think of like an action or like a wrestling move or like when you're mm -hmm. at the supper table to get your elbow up. So I had a bunch of different stuff and then I typed it online. It had a bunch of motorcyclers that were going around corners, putting their elbow down. I was like, oh, that's cool too. Like there's a lot of weird gestures and stuff about that so i was like oh it's kind of it's gestural i kind of like it you know so right well my instinct when i heard is is i thought it just must be some tip for playing some instrument i had no idea it was so specific to a situation yeah that that's, that's how much more universal that's how random it was yeah yeah <laughs> so graham Thanks. i know you a bit from the montreal open mic scene and i'm gonna ask you some questions about your origin story but i thought uh how about uh gavin and shady why don't you talk about your own uh musician origin stories and how you came to be part of this band <laughs> all right well you're playing guitar not drums um around the age of 13 12 something like that um been almost a couple of decades now but um yeah and then um that was in lebanon and then when i came here um i also got involved with the open mic scene a little bit and then uh, i met a few drummers and kind of and also me being uh, really into uh, Porcupine Tree, and Gavin Harrison specifically, uh, kind of got me into drums. So I had a teacher here, um, 
Ben Ben Mayo Goldberg. He uh, taught me drums here. A really good drummer. And um, yeah, uh, but years later, basically, I, I had been moving around, but um, I met um, the guys. We met at uh, Courcel, right? Or no, we met yeah. at uh, local legend. So I have, I have to ask because uh, my my taste may, aren't so interesting. Is Porcupine Tree a very common influence for drummers? When it comes to drummers, I just know the ones in the famous bands, you know, Ringo, Charlie, etc. I mean, I love those guys too, but uh, no, no, he, Gavin Harris is, um, he, he's got, um, I think he was stopped by Steve Gadd, I'm not sure. You know, don't, don't quote me on that, but um, they have similar kind of techniques anyway, um, in a way. But they're both really, really smooth uh, drummers. Gavin's more, um, uh, metal, I guess, metal oriented, whereas Steve Gadd's more jazz. But yeah, he's, uh, he's kind of more in the prog rock scene, um, like very prog. Like he, he, he was part of King Crimson. Um, he is, he still is, and he has a, he has a new band now also, and Pork Country's back. So yeah, mostly prog rock, but. Um, yeah, so jumping to Gavin, I was seeing from the side, when you say bass, uh, you don't just mean, or maybe not at all mean the guitar, you mean bass fiddle. Like in elbow down stuff, it's mainly uh, electric bass, bass guitar, yeah, a bit of bass, uh, like I, 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 I'm a jazz, I play, play a bit of jazz. So I, I learned bass, uh, upright bass. Yeah. I mean, I, I do all my music just with digital instruments, unfortunately. And I've, I've found that the synthesized version of, uh, the double bass for some reason is more resonant than the synthesized version of electric bass guitar. So, uh, I've been appreciating yeah. it more lately. I mean, we had, uh, the BBC orchestra plug in on for logic on our, uh, uh, on our computer uh, on and uh the, the the acoustic like bass sound like the, the sounds are really good in that plugin so i guess they're because they're actual samples like someone they actually hired like a you know an upright a professional well, upright bassist to play you know open strings and play through every single note he could on the or she could i guess on the upright and record it various volumes and trigger it as, as a sample, I guess. So it's like, so it sounds like you're working with better material, whether it's real or the, the plugins. Uh, yeah. Graham, I guess what I wanted to ask you about, you told me that you, you previously worked as a teacher and you became very frustrated with curriculums. So your current artistic foray oh, yeah. are almost like a breakout into freedom. A little bit, you know, a little bit. Like I, I feel like I, I, you know, I, I don't think I could be a genuine teacher without having tried to follow my own path in music first, you know. I think that was the frustrating thing. And you're you're right, Zach. I was talking about that curriculum. That that was kind of ragging on my brain like a lot. You know, it was just that uh yeah, just what we teach kids. Like I, I was thinking about this, like a lot of stuff that they do in school just makes kids feel like they're worth less than they actually are, you know. I think that school does that a lot to like kids. I was just thinking about that the other day and I just mentioned it to this engineer um, today. I was talking to him and I was like, yeah, I think that school kind of tries to makes you devalue yourself. And so I felt like, yeah, that curriculum did that a lot. And I was, a, yeah, I was a frustrated teacher. Um, you know, I, I don't have as much angst anymore because it's been so long since I've taught, you know what I mean? So I, I haven't, you know, because I feel like when I met you, Zach, I was very angsty, was I? No, you, you seemed quite collected, but I'm sure <laughs> okay. inside you were. But yeah, I've, I've come to terms with certain things. Yeah, I've come to like, kind of like understand it a lot better and, and you know, come to peace with it now, maybe after like a few years and the pandemic and stuff, you know. Right. I, I mean, focusing on the music, does it sort of make you think back and I don't know, imagine like do, teaching the music to kids? Uh, do you ever make up your own yeah. curriculum in your heads? Yeah, like, I don't know, like, I you wonder what you could do with if you were free to teach 30 kids, whatever you knew about life, like what could you do with those 30 people over a year? I think you could do like way better stuff than what they're getting them to do. And I think that obviously it's making sure that each kid has, they do the best thing that they can do in their class, whether that's play music or whether that's do the album art or whether that's record the sounds or whether that's build a stage or like, whatever like it's like I'm just taking a context of like putting on a music production and imagining what like you could get 30 kids to do that would 
really change their lives over like a course of a year versus learning his like the kind of geography they're teaching these kids already like you just after even seeing everything that's going on gone on in the pandemic it's just it was so dated and old I'm like why are we doing this to these poor children and then making them think that they have to excel at that <laughs> to a very very high level because these were high high achieving kids I taught um to, to they had to excel at that to a very very high level if they wanted to have any worth when when what they're learning isn't adding anything to their their level of growth and I, I would talk to that like the kids were like the best writers in my class and I would read what they wrote and actually it wasn't as good as the kid who was just could barely write at all like in the sense that he was like grasping and trying to articulate ideas but his words are kind of like failing him whereas this person can write in complete sentences but and very nice paragraph structure but it was obviously someone else's ideas it wasn't you know but we just lost Shad. But yeah, um, yeah. So there, there, there was a, yeah. there was a teacher I had in, in grade six, and like, I guess like if I think of like my whole like edu, you know, educational life, like uh, going from like kindergarten to grade twelve, and then to university, like this was like it was he was a grade six teacher, and it was so it was kind of standout for me because like he was a drummer, and uh, he he got uh, he went to like Home Depot and bought like thirty buckets. And he did uh, bucket drumming with everyone, and he wrote compositions like um, for for bucket or bucket drumming arrangements. So he'd have like a sopranos, altos, basses, and he was so passionate about it. And uh, you know, we would you know we would do the regular French, English, all that stuff, and like it would be like two hours of drumming, and it would we do that like three or four times a week. And it would be, and he was so passionate about it. You know, he would listen to his his compositions and give us feedback, and we loved it. And like, it was, it's funny when I think about it, it's like, I guess what made it so like kind of magic was that he was so personally invested in it. This was like a piece of him was being like, get like was being given through like these kids to an audience. Like there was something so like special about it. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember we had a Mr. Cassano, I think he was, he was our new principal that year. And he was getting complaints from parents because they were saying he, the kids are bucket drawing too much. They need to do more schoolwork, um, like, you know, arithmetic and social sciences and stuff. And so he had to pare, you know, pare down the drumming to like, uh, like a couple hours a week. Um, but like, I thought, I thought like, wow, what, what a buzzkill, like what, a, like, you know, like, and it's like, it was something so positive. It's probably going to be like, your, your kid was going to have a memory, like they're going to be 80 and dying and they're going to have a memory from their childhood. It was going to be the bucket drumming. And you just I, took that away from them. Like you just, you just like, no, no childhood memories, like to kill those for, you know, like, I don't know. I just, I found it kind of, but yeah, that's why I sometimes resonate with a bit of, you know, this. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, that's, a, that's a great story. Cause I feel like a lot of the value in school is, I mean, just the act of learning itself. And there's so many things you could choose to learn. And we just arbitrarily, you know, rank some subjects above others. Uh, when I did the silly thing of applying to undergrad schools in the U.S. that I could never afford, I uh, I got a bit of a scare towards the last minute because they asked for letters of reference and it's terrifying just to ask for them. Yeah. And then after everything's due, they sent me back and said, sorry, one of your references doesn't count because it's from a drama teacher and we need academic references. Oh, and this confused me because drama showed up on the report card just like any other thing. We wrote papers for drama class. It felt completely arbitrary that English was completely okay and drama wasn't. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the kind of thinking that uh, puts us artists down. Uh, well, yeah, yeah. I, I, drama is important, man. Drama is, you know, having, yeah, I, I we, we need good actors. I, I've heard even like some, for some yeah. job, like some jobs are, I mean, I heard this, I forget where, but I heard that they're, they're looking for people with actual acting skills. Cause like, I mean, most of the time in prevent, like you're acting really, like <laughs> you have to you have, you have good diction and good pronunciation and stuff, you know? Well, I, I have seen this thing where it's like part of job trainings. They now like hire very convincing actors to portray clients. And it's like surprisingly effective how, you know, talking to a pretend person simulating a real life experience can be. Yeah. I wanted to get more into some band uh, techniques. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you list yourself as a three-piece band, uh, you know, uh, guitar, 
bass drums. The arrangements on your tracks are so intricate. Do you really just try and stick to those core instruments or is there a lot of underlying synth? Like I, I genuinely can't tell sometimes when it's just distorted guitar and, and when it's something, something else. Those first two tracks were mostly guitar. Um, that was pretty much all guitar and guitar effects. <laughs> that's that's Shaggy's cat, Halo. Yes, cat fan. Um, <laughs> and, yeah, Halo didn't play in the song. He, no. <laughs> Mandatory cat zoom bomb. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but but those were those were all just guitar, bass, and drums and backup vocals. So really nothing too super fancy in terms of kind of other instruments. There's the feedback have, thing. Sorry, there is uh, an Ebo actually at. You can go away. Oh. That that mm, that that's actually not a volume swell. That's an Ebo that we recorded. So an Ebo is like a, it's basically it's an electronic thing that triggers this that the string vibrates because of a magnet. There's a magnet, electromagnetic pulse or something that makes it vibrate. And so you don't touch the string. You just hover this plastic doodad over top of it, and the string just so is that was with that. So that's the most fancy thing. We did have an Ebo on those recordings. Yeah, no, it's, it sounded really cool so the the individual singles at least in terms of the recording are very ambitious so are you going to continue you know like just working very hard on standalone singles or with the pandemic clearing up are you going to go for the more conventional album route um so basically what we have planned before the end of the year we have two more songs from that batch of four songs that are coming out um that's a song called why i love you and another one that we're going to perform tonight called no one else but myself mm. Um, basically, uh, the one why I love you are you getting into other instruments. Gavin's actually done a little bit of work with putting on some, it's like not synth, but BBC orchestra stuff, Gav. Yeah, so there are plug in those. We have those. done some electronic. We're kind of breaking, like, we're not tr trying to stick, I guess, maybe like we're not trying to stick super much to like, uh, like drum, bass, vocals, and guitar type thing. We have used kind of a digital plug in now on another things, mm -hmm. and maybe on the future tracks, we we'll probably might do the same thing because you know we're both gotten good we've got a fancy keyboard in here now and uh we've both gotten kind of more comfortable at playing it and stuff and doing all those types of things since it was like first batch of recordings so basically uh, you're at that question so we got two more singles coming out but we want to compile them all into like one ep of mm -hmm. like four songs so that might need to get them remastered and then in the new year um, we have tentative, we've got one recording schedule planned for sure. And that's at Studio Dandaran, where we're going to do four uh, new songs. Um, but we have another four songs that I want to record at, uh, we did a live performance show at Music Technique, which is a music school here in Montreal. And the engineer offered to record us at his studio, which was the studio that I visited just today. And so we might do another four tracks that are not going to say they're B-sides, but they're just old songs that we've kind of, I don't know if we want to put the same amount of energy into them as this new ones for Dandrian. So tentatively scheduled for next year, there should be another eight songs coming out. I don't know if that's going to be a full album or it might just be two EPs, like a double EP is what we were thinking. Yeah, then what's the consideration there? Is it whether you think they go with one piece of album art? Is, is it whether they add up to more than half an hour? Like I've always found um, these I, albums. I guess I'm distinction. One of my considerations sure. now is like the ones, the, that first batch of songs we did at Dandrian, we had just gotten together. I think Shaddy had only been in the band for like maybe like five or six months by then because that was December 2019 when he joined and we did the recordings July 2020. And so that was very short time. It's just like basically this is, you know, it's sort of a presentation of us. And then the newer tracks are like, I'm, I'm the one thing is like the, the stuff that we do in Ian's studio might be a little more experimental. And he mentioned that too, in the sense that like, even like he was saying, um, because we played these songs so long and that we're kind of sick of them maybe he said just like practice them a bit to click and then before you come in the studio don't play them for a month and then just walk in and see what comes out and I think it's kind of interesting different approach whereas Dandran I think will be way more kind of calculated and scheduled yeah sometimes I find it's like sometimes when you like you practice like say you're practicing an instrument you practice it like pretty regularly for a period of time you can take like a two-week vacation go to the cottage you come back and uh it's like those first few notes like they're they're like they're nice i don't know there's something mm -hmm. there's something about like your mind is clear yeah. uh you know and mm -hmm. it's because I, I i sort of understand it through like when you're practicing when you're practicing you're you're kind of committing things to the subconscious right like you shouldn't when you're performing you shouldn't be thinking right like it's 
So yeah. when you're practicing, you're kind of committing these things to the subconscious. And then when you take a break, um, when you go, when you take a break, you know, you're working with your conscious mind, practicing, 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 you take two weeks off. Really, the only thing that's going to be running is your subconscious because, I mean, consciously, you're going to be thinking of after the cottage, you're going to be thinking of lakes and campfires and stuff. So sure. I don't know, I, fi I find that. So I think that's kind of like, that's like the, the cottage approach, you know? Yeah. Right. Well, uh, I used to have this problem doing classical piano where you actually like know the song faster in your head than your fingers can play it. So it's possible, I guess, to over practice a thing and then start exactly. reverting into making mistakes again uh, i've never yeah. had that with guitar type stuff but you're you're playing fancier things than i ever did yeah but like i think it's like especially like with with like cl like classical stuff where it's so much like you have to you know you're you're lit there's the interpretation ends at you have to the you know the velocity on a note on piano it's like oh you can play those notes a little more articulated or something like like there's, I, I mean, I don't know with classical, like, but like, or like the the the, te the tempo you can, you know, the the time you can be a little more elastic with it or something like, but like it's so much of it is like you play this piece the way it is written, you know, like. But sure. so like when you when you when you when you say you know you you memorized it, you throw the music away, and then you go take a week off at the cottage, come back to it, and you're you're flowing like a little bit, you know, and even when you make a mistake, it still works or something, you know, like. I don't know. Yeah. So last question, I wanted to ask about the the lyrics uh, uh, vocally. Uh, I, I don't know if it's both of you singing or primarily Graham. It, it kind of sounds like uh, Gord Downey a bit, but then the tone of the lyrics, it's more Morrissey, uh, certainly very morbid uh, with the first one and then arguably kind of the same with uh, the Swimming with the Fishes one. Uh, so what's going on lyrically in those two songs? Um, I think Swimmy with Fish is sort of like about, um, I think I sort of wrote that about like kind of putting something to bed in life and trying to like start something new. And then uh, You Can Go Away would be, um, I think that was just kind of feeling like a little bit regretful for leaving a situation like prematurely when I, like, I was like, why did I just, you know, why did I leave that, you know? So it's like putting myself in the per, like the place of the person that I just like kind of ditched. Do you know what I mean? And you kind of like left that person. Okay, um, so it's it's not your own anger. You're uh, you're projecting almost your fear of someone else's anger into it. Yeah, you're trying to think like, what oh, man? How 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 does that person feel? Because like I feel like awful that like I just failed on this person. Um, you know what I mean? And putting, trying to put yourself in that person's shoes and that person, you know, yeah, like not caring. Yeah. You can go away. Um, I don't, you know, trying to like maybe disconnect or being a little apathetic to you leaving them. And yeah, you know, like I kind of get that. So, uh, so yeah, so that was, that's what those lyrics are there. I didn't mean for them to be morbid, but, but yeah, I guess like, uh, yeah, I guess not more of it. I mean, dark, I caustic. What, kind of thing. what did we get? We got like an explicit lyric tag in one of our songs. And then oh. Shadi mentioned that like swimming with fish. I guess that's from like a GTA thing. There's well, like it's the, from the Godfather uh, and possibly older than that. Yeah. Uh, swimming with fish is like you're, you're, you killed the guy and you put him in. Yeah. The water, he's, he's so sleeping with the fishies. Yeah. Okay. So I didn't know that. <laughs> Still just, surprised would get tagged, but. Yeah, I, I didn't didn't know that, but uh, but yeah, so we we did get tagged on that one. Excellent. Well, I mean, it's been great uh, to to hear about uh, your process and uh, all the thoughts tangential to it, uh, uh, Graham, Gavin, and Shaddy. And now uh, we're gonna hear an impromptu acoustic version of one of the songs. Uh, while they're setting up, I can show you one of uh, Graham's art pieces. Oh yeah, yeah. Very nice. I do I do a lot of like uh, watercolor and just like plein air painting. That's nice. That's like uh, that's like Square Saint Louis yeah. in Montreal. It's a little tight, but like we'll try to. Uh, is, is this Love okay, it. Zach? We got uh, we got here. We have Oscar Peterson, and then there we have Elvis. Elvis. So they're going to be joining us tonight. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, so this song uh, is soon to be released, but in electric version and uh, before the end of the year it's called no one else but myself
car so long My legs are feeling numb I thought I left without waving My memory's been hazy I thought I left in a hurry I had you so worried Had a pretty good stay It wasn't what it used to be That, that was beautiful, and I can tell once you get it in the studio, it's going to be great. I, I really appreciated the double bass sound, the harmonies. Uh, yeah, it was uh, it was great to hear from you three today, and looking forward to hearing what you do next. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Zach, man. This was fun. Thank you. Thank you for having us. So that was my interview with Graham, Gavin, and Shaddy of Elbow Down. And uh, it was a bit of a logistical challenge because I've interviewed, I think, only one band before. Uh, that was uh, the Italian punk band Billy Cock, and they were all in the same space. This was a bit different because I had two different screens. I'm interviewing three different people, you know, all of whom really could have been interviewed in their own right. And then when it come to, comes to the doing the little performance at the end, poor Shaddy's in another screen, and there's a law, uh, there's a lag because it's the internet, so he can't really do his drumming. Uh, but what he told me afterwards is he was trying to do some lead guitar during because he thought the lag would matter less for that than uh, with his drums. So listen for Shaddy's guitar playing in the background. But that was a fun interview talking to three spirited artistic guys. Uh, and I can't wait to see what music they put out to come going forward. So please continue to support this channel, like and subscribe and all the fun stuff. I'm Zach Morgenstern. This is Ludwig von B. See you next time. Mm -hmm.